Harold Bumblethwack, an average man of no particularly remarkable skills, save for a dubious knack for burning toast, found himself in quite the predicament. What had started as an ordinary fishing trip, a bit of peace and quiet, maybe a cold beer or two, had ended with him marooned on an island that appeared on no known map. How, you might ask, did Harold manage this? Well, if you were to trace his steps, it involved an unfortunate encounter with an oddly sentient fish, a GPS system that took its orders from a sock puppet and a boat motor that mysteriously exploded after Harold, against all advice, decided to give it a gentle tap with a hammer. As he crawled onto the shore, half-dazed and covered in seaweed, Harold's first thought was simple. I'm going to miss the pub quiz tonight. His second thought, however, was more pressing. Where the bloody hell am I? The island seemed off. The sand was too soft, like walking on whipped cream. The trees were tall and twisted, as if designed by a committee that couldn't agree whether they were meant to be palm trees or dental floss. And the air had a peculiar hum, like the world's largest refrigerator was lurking just out of sight. But the most unusual part, the tall, statuesque figures approaching him. They were, how to put this delicately, extremely tall, extremely statuesque, and very much not human. They wore elaborate trial outfits that might have resembled something out of a futuristic courtroom drama, except there were no wigs, and the fabric seemed to shimmer like a live Instagram filter. Harold blinked, shook his head, and blinked again. He did this a few more times, hoping that the combination of dehydration, hunger, and sunstroke would stop making the women look like seven-foot-tall alien supermodels with glowing skin and impeccable posture. No such luck. They were still there, chatting amongst themselves in a language that sounded suspiciously like someone had tuned a radio to whale song, but make it funky. Before Harold could piece together a coherent thought, one of the women stepped forward. She was breathtaking in the way that made Harold's heart do a little dance while simultaneously forgetting how lungs worked. She looked at him with eyes that shimmered like the cosmos and smiled. It was the kind of smile that could melt glaciers or cause really bad butter sculptures to collapse. Greetings, human male she said, in a voice that sounded like it had been specifically designed to make all other voices feel inadequate. You are welcome here as a sign of great significance. Harold, unsure if he was still concussed, responded with the only question that seemed appropriate in the moment. Right, um, where exactly is here? And why do you all look like you just stepped out of a high-fashion alien catalogue? The women exchanged a few murmurs before the leader spoke again, her glowing beauty giving the sun an inferiority complex. This is not just any island, she began with a gravitas that suggested Harold should brace himself for some profound revelation. This is our home, a camouflaged spaceship, once a world in itself now. Well, it's a bit broken, but we make do. Harold, to his credit, only blinked twice. Right. A spaceship. On Earth. Obviously. So how did you lot end up, you know, here? Another round of whale song funk murmuring, and then the leader said, We have been here for centuries, hidden, waiting for the final sign. You, human male, are that sign. Harold scratched his head. Me? I'm the sign. Couldn't you have grabbed any bloke off the street? There's Dave from the pub. He's got an interesting mole. Seems like he'd make a better candidate. No, the leader said, smiling with a patience reserved for explaining complex tax forms. It had to be you. Your genes are unique. You are the last piece we need to complete our ritual. Harold gulped. Ritual? What kind of ritual are we talking about here? The leader's eyes sparkled, as if she had just received a particularly exciting email. It is a ritual of, how do you humans say it, easy fluid extraction. Harold's mind did some very complicated gymnastics to avoid arriving at the most obvious conclusion. Fluid extraction? Could you, uh, maybe clarify that a bit? 
One of the alien women who had been quietly adjusting her trial outfit whispered to another, This one is dense, in a language Harold thankfully didn't understand. The leader stepped closer, her cosmic glow intensifying. It's simple. We need your fluids to restore our ship's life-giving energy source. You're quite the specimen, Harold Bumblethwack. Harold's face turned the color of an overly ripe tomato. Right. Fluid extraction. Just to be clear, we're talking, you know, medically, like a blood test or... The leader grinned, a mischievous grin that suggested the ritual might be a little more involved. Harold fainted, and so Harold Bumblethwack, who had merely wanted a peaceful fishing trip, found himself in the most peculiar of situations. He was the unwitting key to a ritual that, while perhaps not entirely unpleasant, was certainly far from what he'd expected when he'd packed his sandwiches that morning. When Harold awoke, he was lying on what felt like a bed made entirely out of marshmallows. He blinked groggily, trying to piece together if everything he'd just experienced was a bizarre hallucination caused by eating a suspiciously old sandwich he'd found at the bottom of his fishing tackle box. He lifted his head and found himself staring up at a large domed ceiling that looked like the inside of a lava lamp. Swirling colors, shimmering patterns, and occasional glows of light that seemed to pulse in rhythm with his increasing panic. Oh, you're awake, said a voice that could only be described as an ethereal purr. Harold turned his head and saw the leader of the alien women standing by his side, still glowing faintly, like a walking advertisement for luxury skincare products. Great, he muttered, sitting up slowly. So, it wasn't a dream then, still on the weird alien island, still the chosen one. Still need my fluids? Precisely, she replied, her smile both reassuring and frankly terrifying. Harold sighed. Look, I'm flattered, truly I am, but fluids? I mean, I'm not sure I'm the guy you want for this sort of thing. There's got to be other options. We've got this thing on Earth called a volunteers, you know? The leader tilted her head, her glowing eyes studying him as though he were a particularly interesting puzzle. No, Harold Bumblethwack, you are the only one. Your genetic makeup is uniquely suited to restore our ship's systems. You are, as you humans might say, the missing puzzle piece. Right, a puzzle piece, of course I am, Harold muttered, rubbing his temples. And you're sure this isn't something I can get out of with a strongly worded letter or maybe a polite refusal? She shook her head with an apologetic smile. Unfortunately, no. It is an ancient ritual, and your presence here is predestined. Harold stared at her for a moment, then sighed again. Okay, fine, but can we at least talk about what kind of fluids we're talking about here? I mean, I've got options. Blood, sweat, tears, you name it. I've even got a bit of belly button lint if that'll help. The leader blinked at him, clearly unamused by his suggestions. It is not quite so crude as you imagine. Our ritual involves a process of energy transference, extracting the essence of life from your unique molecular structure. Energy transference, Harold repeated, nodding slowly. Right, sounds a bit like you're describing, well, I don't want to be indelicate here, but are we talking about reproduction? The leader raised an elegant eyebrow. Reproduction. No, no, Harold. That would be a rather inefficient use of your, how do you say, assets. No, this is purely scientific. We simply need to extract your life force, and our advanced technology will take care of the rest. Harold's face lit up with relief. Oh, oh, that's all, just my life force. Well, that's much better than what I was thinking. Then he paused. Wait a minute. My life force. Are we talking the kind that leaves me, you know, dead? Not dead, the leader said thoughtfully, as if considering her words carefully. Just, well, maybe a little tired. You might feel like you've run a marathon, or three, but you'll live. I assure you. Harold squinted at her, feeling deeply unconvinced. Right, tired. Okay, sure. And after you've, uh, extracted my life force, I just 
pop back onto my boat and paddle off into the sunset, yeah? The leader smiled, but there was something faintly ominous in the gleam of her eyes. Oh, Harold, you will have a place of honor here among us. You will never need to return to your simple life. You will be revered. That's nice and all, but I really wasn't planning on getting stranded for the rest of my life. I've got a goldfish back home. Name's Trevor. He'll be missing me by now. The leader exchanged a glance with one of the other alien women who had silently appeared behind her, holding what looked suspiciously like a very high-tech blender. It is time, she said softly, and Harold's stomach dropped. The other women began to gather around him, forming a circle, their shimmering robes flowing like liquid light. One of them produced a strange device that hummed ominously, like an electric razor from a dystopian future. Harold gulped. Hold on a second, you're sure this isn't going to be fatal? Because I've got a strong aversion to, well, dying. The leader placed a hand on his shoulder, her touch sending a bizarre yet calming tingle through his body. Do not worry, Harold. The process is completely safe. Completely safe for me, right? He asked, eyes wide, as he watched the high-tech blender gadget start glowing. For you, she confirmed with a nod, and then, after a brief pause, added, Mostly near enough, as you humans would say. Mostly? Harold yelped. That's not exactly filling me with confidence, you know, and by the way, that saying is for home DIY projects and peanut tossing at the pub, not for complex medical procedures. Before Harold could protest further, the ritual began. The women chanted in their melodic, whale-song language, and the device began to pulse with a faint blue light. Harold closed his eyes, bracing himself for, well, something. He wasn't quite sure what, but he was fairly certain it would involve more discomfort than he'd experienced since that unfortunate incident with the lawnmower and his toe. As the machine whirred and hummed, Harold felt a strange sensation, like he was being gently vacuumed from the inside out. It was oddly soothing, in a terrifying kind of way. After what felt like both an eternity and only a moment, the machine beeped cheerfully, as if it had just completed a very satisfying smoothie. There, the leader said, smiling warmly, it is done. Harold cautiously opened one eye, then the other. He was still alive. More importantly, he was still mostly intact, although he did feel a bit like he'd been dragged through a very long, very weird dream. That's it? I'm not dead. Not dead, she confirmed. Just slightly less alive. Harold stared at her, baffled. Slightly less alive? That's not exactly comforting. The leader shrugged elegantly. You'll be fine after some rest, and now, thanks to you, our ship systems are fully restored. Harold glanced around, half expecting the island to lift off and fly into space. Instead, everything looked exactly the same, except for the fact that he felt like he'd just run a marathon while also donating blood and possibly a kidney all at once. So, can I go home now? Harold asked weakly. The leader smiled mysteriously. We'll see. Harold sat there, blinking into the strange glow of the alien women, trying to piece together what had just happened. He had survived the life force extraction, though he felt like he'd just been through the world's most exhausting yoga class, combined with an extremely overzealous blood donation drive. The leader, whom he now mentally referred to as Glowy Magoddess, smiled at him still exuding that impossible beauty that could probably sell overpriced moisturizers on a different planet. You've done us a great service, Harold Bumblethwack, she said, her voice smooth like intergalactic velvet, and for that you shall be rewarded. Harold perked up. Rewarded? Oh, I like the sound of that. A nice, comfortable bed and maybe a sandwich would be great, and a pint of something cold, wouldn't go amiss. The leader chuckled softly, as if Harold had said something endearingly naive. No, no, we offer you something much grander. 
Harold felt a surge of hope. Maybe they were going to let him go after all. Maybe they'd fixed his boat. Maybe he'd get to go home, throw his feet up, and pretend none of this ever happened. But, as with everything on this island, things took a rather unexpected turn. You have two choices, Harold, the leader continued, pacing in front of him like a regal cat, about to pounce on a very confused mouse. As a reward for restoring our ship, we offer you the honor of selecting three wives from among our finest. We wives, Harold spluttered, his eyes darting nervously to the tall, shimmering women who had gathered around him, each of them smiling in a way that suggested they took their job of being finest wives very seriously. Three, isn't that a bit excessive? The leader raised an eyebrow, clearly unamused by Harold's reluctance. On our world, it is customary to reward a hero in this manner. We value strength, wit, and fluid contribution. Harold turned red again. Right, yes, that last bit. But I uh, don't exactly see myself as the marrying type, especially not three times over. And, well, I barely know any of you. Knowledge can come later, she said smoothly, her eyes twinkling in a way that made Harold feel like a small insect under a very large magnifying glass. Your other option, of course, is to leave. But if you choose to leave, we must wipe your memories of this place entirely. You will return to your simple life, never recalling any of what happened here. The choice is yours. Harold stared at her, mouth hanging slightly open. This was an absurd decision to be faced with after a fishing trip gone wrong. His brain was struggling to keep up. Three alien wives. That was... Well, it was more responsibility than he was prepared for. And honestly, the idea of trying to explain that to anyone back on Earth was enough to send his stress levels through the roof. He could barely remember to water his houseplants. On the other hand, the thought of having his memory wiped wasn't exactly appealing either. Would he just wake up back on his boat, thinking he'd dozed off during a particularly bad hangover? What if they messed up the memory-wiping process and he forgot how to tie his shoelaces or operate a toaster? The leader noticed his hesitation and stepped closer, her presence intoxicating in that otherworldly way. Consider this carefully, Harold. If you choose to stay, you will be honoured among our people. Your life will be one of comfort and, shall we say, fulfilment. You'll want for nothing. Harold felt a bead of sweat slide down his forehead. And if I leave, I just go back to my boring old life, eh? No memory of all this weirdness. Yes, she replied with a faint shrug. But remember, Harold, your life force is now connected to our ship. It may take some time to adjust if you choose to return to your old life. There could be side effects. Side effects, Harold gulped. What kind of side effects are we talking about? The leader waved a hand dismissively. Minor things. Unpredictable bursts of energy. Unusual cravings. Perhaps an increased sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. But nothing life-threatening. Harold's mind raced. On one hand, he had the option of an admittedly exotic lifestyle with three alien supermodel wives, but with the obvious complications of, well, being married to three alien supermodel wives. On the other hand, he could go back to his regular boring life, if you could call being Harold Bumblethwack's life anything other than extraordinarily boring, but with the added mystery of potential side effects that sounded like they came straight from the warning label of a dubious energy drink. Right, Harold said slowly, his brain doing cartwheels as it weighed the pros and cons. And, uh, if I don't choose either. The leader gave him a dazzling smile, her eyes narrowing just slightly. Then we make the choice for you. Harold wasn't sure if that was a threat or just a very firm offer, but he had the distinct feeling that letting them choose was not going to end well for him. Well, Harold started rubbing his chin, it's a tempting offer truly, but three wives, that's an awful lot of in-laws to manage, isn't it? The leader tilted her head. We don't have in-laws. Oh, right. Still, I think, well, I mean, I don't know if I'm cut out for that kind of hero life.
The leader's smile didn't falter, but there was something in her gaze that made Harold feel like he was walking a tightrope above a pit of very hungry sharks. And you wish to leave then? she asked, her voice cool and measured, as if she were genuinely curious about why anyone would ever choose such a thing. Harold sighed. Look, I'm a simple man. I like my toast slightly burned. I like fishing on weekends. And I've got a goldfish named Trevor that needs feeding. I think I'll have to go with the memory wipe option. The leader gave a small, disappointed nod and gestured to the women surrounding him. They stepped forward, their hands raised, each one holding a small metallic device that hummed ominously. Harold gave one last nervous smile. You'll really wipe everything? No chance I'll wake up remembering I was propositioned by three alien wives? No memories, the leader confirmed. You'll wake up on your boat, your life force returned to its normal state, and the island will fade from your mind like a dream you never had. Well, Harold said with a nod, it's been weird, but good luck with the spaceship and all. The leader leaned down, her eyes glowing brightly. Goodbye, Harold Bumblethwack. You were... amusing. Harold barely had time to process the strange compliment before the metallic devices clicked and a soft hum filled the air. His vision blurred, the sounds of the island faded, and for a brief moment he felt as though he were floating. Then everything went dark. When Harold woke up, he was back on his boat. The sun was shining, the water was calm, and his fishing rod bobbed gently in the water as if nothing had ever happened. He blinked, staring around at the clear horizon, confused. Had he fallen asleep? He couldn't quite remember. It must have been a very strange dream, something about aliens and fluids. Shaking his head, Harold looked at his watch. Blimey, I've missed the pub quiz. With a sigh, he started up the boat's motor and began the slow journey back to shore. Behind him, the island shimmered one last time before disappearing entirely, leaving nothing but open water in its wake. Harold Bumblethwack returned home feeling oddly refreshed. Well, not refreshed exactly, more like confused, with a lingering sense that he'd forgotten something important but couldn't quite place what. He docked his fishing boat, trudged up the familiar path to his little house, and sighed as he unlocked the door. Ah, home sweet! Before he could finish, Harold froze. Standing in the middle of his modest living room were three of the most stunning women he had ever seen. They were tall, taller than his ceiling lamps could really accommodate, and they had an ethereal glow about them, like they were fresh out of a beauty salon where all the stylists were stars and nebulae. Harold's mouth hung open as the three women smiled at him in unison, their glowing skin shimmering in the light of his dim, flickering table lamp. They wore something akin to space-age bathrobes, crossed with haute couture, and Harold couldn't help but feel like his cosy little house had suddenly been invaded by a fashion shoot from an alien version of Vogue. Welcome home, Harold! the tallest of them said, her voice as smooth as an alien smoothie machine. She stepped forward, the very air around her shimmering as she moved. We are your wives. Harold blinked, blinked again, then finally managed. My what? The woman, who was clearly in charge, gave him a patient, slightly condescending smile, like a kindergarten teacher explaining gravity to a particularly slow child. Your wives. We have been sent here by Queen Zarnella as a reward for your heroic efforts in restoring our ship. Harold's brain was struggling to catch up, but I thought I... Wait, didn't I choose the memory wipe option? The second wife, a statuesque beauty with eyes that sparkled like two small galaxies, shook her head with a grin. Yes, well, the Queen decided that you deserved a reward anyway. Something about being amusing and strangely entertaining for a human. So, here we are. We're here to fulfill all your needs, added the third wife, whose voice could probably melt butter at twenty paces. She was casually rearranging his bookshelf, though considering she was a good foot taller than the shelf. This involved bending at an alarming angle that made Harold's brain short-circuit momentarily. 
Harold pinched himself. Nope, still awake. Right, he said slowly, trying to process what was happening. So, you're my wives? Yes, they all said in perfect, unsettling unison. And you're staying here, in this house? Yes, they echoed again with unnerving cheerfulness. Harold looked around his small living room. There was barely enough space for him, his goldfish Trevor, and his collection of mildly embarrassing souvenir mugs, let alone three Amazonian alien women. But there's only one bedroom, he mumbled, his mind frantically searching for some excuse, any excuse that might buy him time to figure out what was happening. We'll manage, the leader said with a knowing smile. I can sleep standing. The second one chimed in, completely unfazed by the logistics. I'll take the couch, said the third, already making herself comfortable on it in a way that made Harold feel like it was no longer his couch at all. Harold's head was spinning. But what about your ship? Aren't you supposed to be, I don't know, flying off into space or something? The leader shook her head, her glowing hair moving like it was being swayed by an invisible wind. Our ship is now fully operational, thanks to you. But we've been granted a permanent stay here, on Earth, to honor our new life, with you. Harold gulped. This was rapidly becoming less of a reward and more of a terrifying reality. He'd barely managed relationships on Earth, let alone with three towering alien women who had probably never heard of the concept of personal space. Well, this is a lot, Harold admitted glancing at the kitchen where the second wife was now inspecting his refrigerator with a look of pure disdain. This milk is expired, she announced, holding up a carton with two fingers like it was some kind of biohazard. And what's that? asked the third wife, pointing at Trevor, who was swimming his usual lazy circles in the fishbowl. Is that a food source? That's my goldfish! Harold yelped, rushing over protectively. He's not for eating, and definitely not a food source. The three women exchanged puzzled looks, as though they couldn't fathom why anyone would keep such a small, useless creature. A pet, the leader mused. How quaint. Harold stood there, wringing his hands, as the full absurdity of his situation settled in. Look, I'm really flattered. No, really. But I didn't exactly sign up for three wives. I didn't even sign up for one. We understand, the leader said, her smile just a touch mischievous. But the queen insists, and her decisions are final. So here we are, Harold, ready to serve and fulfill your desires. Right desires, Harold muttered, his heart doing an odd fluttering thing. I mostly just desire to sit on my couch, eat beans on toast and watch telly, to be honest. The three wives exchanged a bemused glance, then, with a flourish, the leader conjured a tray of what appeared to be the most extravagant beans on toast Harold had ever seen, complete with some kind of glowing sauce. Your wishes are our command. Harold sat down in a daze as they all watched him expectantly. This was going to take some getting used to. He took a bite of the beans on toast delicious, surprisingly, and then stared at his three new wives, who were now rearranging his life with an efficiency that was both terrifying and oddly comforting. Well, he muttered between bites, at least Trevor's safe. And the beans are good. He wasn't sure how long this would last, or what bizarre twist was waiting for him next, but Harold Bumblethwack, of all people, had somehow ended up with three alien supermodel wives. And if there was one thing he'd learned from his unfortunate fishing trip, it was to expect the unexpected. As long as he could still get to the pub on quiz night, he figured he could handle it. Probably. And if they are more like genies, then this could work. Or do I only get three wishes, he thought, looking over at the three beautiful alien wives who were staring at Harold shrugging, their shoulders in sync.